Okay, I think we're ready to go. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this webinar on aligning the EU's foreign policy with the Paris Agreement. My name is Mehreen Khan. I am one of the Brussels correspondents for the Financial Times, who's hosting today. My job in our bureau is to cover environmental policy, to cover the EU's external relations, to cover the EU's institutions. And those are all themes that we're going to bring together in today's discussion. Um, for everyone watching, I would encourage you, if you want to raise themes and some issues while we're speaking to put it into the q a box which i can see and then hopefully during the discussion we can put this to the panelists as we speak so nobody has to wait too long until the end to get their questions answered um we're going to have a bit of a uh, um today's session is going to involve uh, a discussion the q a but we're going to begin with a, with uh, introductory remarks and then the presentation of the report which hopefully everyone will be able to access because it does go live uh, right now um, and uh, not in their order of speaking, but I will announce who we have today. First of all, when we do our intro introductory remarks, we'll come from Hannah Newman, who's a German MEP for the Greens. Um, she's part of delegations which deal with EU relationships with the Arab Peninsula. Um, she's the vice chair on the subcommittee for human rights. Um, and Hannah's going to be opening and then coming back a bit later for the discussion. Uh, also part of the discussion will be Mark van Herkelen. He is speaking, and I have to stress in a personal capacity, but Mark is the EU's ambassador at large for climate diplomacy and was formerly ambassador ambassador at the World Trade Organization. Uh, Mark's also going to be giving us his thoughts as somebody who's working inside the EU, but as I stress, it will not be uh, um, the official position of the Commission, but just his own. And then finally, we also have Hannah Ryder. Hannah is the founder and CEO of Development Reimagined. Um, it is an uh, in international development consultancy. Um, she's also a former diplomat and an economist. I don't think you can be a former economist, so she's still an economist. And Hannah is going to be speaking to us a little bit about um, how perhaps the rest of the world views the EU's uh, attempts um, to uh, export its climate norms to third countries and, and perhaps the view from outside the EU. Um, so as I said, we are going to have a bit of a, a, a structured session. Um, we're going to begin with you, Hannah Neumann, to give your introductory remarks, perhaps to lay out why we're having this discussion right now. It's been a couple of weeks since COP26 wrapped up. Um, the EU's FIP55 package is very much in earnest and underway as a legislative um, you know, blitz of almost 13 policies. And the questions about the EU's external relationships, particularly with the launch of Global Gateway, which we'll also talk about a bit later, are also um, gearing up and probably will be big themes for the new year. So Hannah, why don't I hand it over to you to give us some introductory remarks, and then we'll hear a little bit later from Jenny Tolman, who present the report uh, and sort of summarise its findings for us. Thank you so much, Maureen, for bringing me in and I think bringing everyone into this discussion. And I want to thank everyone who is um, with us today and everyone who's going to read that report. Um, as you may have seen, I'm, I'm trying to shut out Brussels Sun, um, but it's very persistent. Um, so I hope you can bear with uh, some light surrounding me. Um, but uh, looking at the grey months ahead, I think we shouldn't bother too much about Brussels Sun. Um, about today's topic and um, this study, first of all, I'm very happy that we could get E3G as a think tank to help us um, or to, to primarily work on that study, but also to coordinate with so many other think tanks and organizations working on the issue of climate foreign policy that have been popping up in the European Union in so many member states, but also in the Brussels area in, in recent months and years, clearly showing from a think tank side that there is a push to discuss these issues, but also from the political side that there is a growing need for us to get information, knowledge and understanding about how we can use foreign policy to advance. Well, I mean, the goal we all subscribe to, which is the Paris Agreement and subsequent COPs. I think what is very clear for everyone is that if you want to have a world to live in in 20, 30 or 40 years, it's important that we take action immediately. And this is not just a green party people ideology, but it's a common sense across the globe. The Paris Agreement that I just referred to was actually adopted by 196 parties. So this is many, many, nearly all states around the globe. And it defines the key objective, which is to make sure that we have a global temperature rise, which is well below two degrees Celsius 
um, well, maybe even 1.5, which is the aim we are looking at. The European Union has set out since the von der Leyen presidency to do its part in it. We have discussed and voted on the EU Green Deal. We are now discussing on the Fit for 55 package, which allows us to have climate neutrality and by 2055. We are discussing what this means for the different sectors involved, mobility, agrar, housing and so on. And well, me as a Green, I, I would always hope to have these plans even more ambitious, but overall, and especially in global comparison, we can say that the European Union is doing its homework. So domestically, by and large, we kind of have a plan, and now we just need to have persistence to walk down this road. When it comes to foreign policy, we are not there yet. And I think that is the next step that the European Union has to do. It is very clear that alone as the European Union, we cannot save this planet because the European Union only makes up 9%, for example, of the CO2 emissions. So to make sure that we reach our gap of climate neutrality, we also need to take care of those who are, um, who, who are in charge of the 91% of emissions and to make sure we get them into the same boat. Um, what COP, recent COP has shown is that we cannot necessarily count on the usual superpowers, meaning China and USA to take care of this. Um, China has consists considerably weakened or watered down um, the COP agreement. The USA has set out ambitiously in rhetoric, especially with its special climate and why and all these things. But it seems that the agenda is also based a bit on, on US self-interest and they are not gaining the confidence of many others that we need for this transformation. So there is a huge gap that the European Union can fill, can fill given its credibility, standing up for international values and multilateralism. Paris Agreement is a key cornerstone of multilateral agreements, but also given its enormous economic power, if you take all 27 member states together, but also its excellent diplomatic standing and its pre-existing ties when it comes to development cooperation um, and um, the kind of support that has already been given to, to transformation in the many countries that have signed the Paris Agreement. And because we have this need out there, because we have the implementation gaps, not just in the EU, but even bigger in other countries. And because the EU has this huge potential. Um, I know that the European Union External Action Service has embarked a bit in giving food for thought into that one. And I'm very happy to have Mark with us today, who can surely shed more light on it even than I can do. But we, we really wanted to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity that is out there for the European Union. And that's why we commissioned this study to, to E3G, um, also making sure that we have the input from many other actors in it um, to bring together the knowledge that is out there on how the European Union in its trade policy, in its international cooperation policy, in its classical foreign policy, but also in its security and defense policy can use the leverage we have best um, to move ahead um, the climate agenda and to make sure that all these countries um, who have signed Paris will be supported to live up to this goal or will be encouraged or will be notched or will be forced. It depends a bit, I mean, on where they stand and the approach that we should take. And I can clearly see that the study has an answer to all um, these different sides. And I'm very happy that we have Hannah Ryder with us who can exactly complement the EU perspective in terms of, well, I mean, what are the expectations? What are the fears? Um, but then also what could be EU strategies to bring these different countries from the different backgrounds on board? Um, what, what is very clear is that, and, and that's maybe the main criticism I have to some degree also to Ursula von der Leyen laying out the Green Deal and all these ambitions. When, when, when she had these, um, the, the, this big moment in the European Parliament, and I was very happy that she brought the discussion to the European Parliament, she said it's, it's our men or women on the moon moment. And whereas this clearly shows the ambition um, that we have for us and the kind of, I mean, big impact it will have if we reach it. Well, the man on the moon moment was also one where we were spoiling resources um, to go into big power competition. And what we are looking at right now has to be, from my understanding, very much the opposite. So it's about 
global cooperation to save resources. Um, and I, I want our EU strategy to be very clear, and I'm happy that this is a perspective that has been shared by the experts working on this um, strategy, that this whole living up to Paris ambition issue, it's not about competition. It can only work if it's about cooperation. And we really need to see how we can reconcile what we do dom domestically, which also is watched with a lot of skepticism externally when it comes to carbon border adjustment mechanism, but also when it comes to moving away from a dependency on fossil um, energy, because there are people, I mean, there are countries who build as of now their geopolitical power on having exactly these fossils amongst them. I'm, for example, thinking about the GCC countries, but there are others. So we also need to see how we can move towards a cooperative mode and make very clear that the hand is outstretched and we can only reach this goal together. Another aspect um, where I think this study is very strong and I'm looking forward um, to Jennifer's um, further um, expl explanations is the that there is a certain fear and that's something we share EU domestically as much as globally um, about the change that is coming because it is very clear we will only reach the Paris goals if we have a rather full social and economic tr transformation um, to reach our ecological goals. And we have this discussion inside the European Union between those who may have to deliver more of a change and those who are already a bit further ahead and how, for example, the Just Transition Fund is one mechanism on how we can, can, can deal with these differences. And we will have similar discussions on the global scale. But what has to become very clear, and that's something also in terms of diplomacy, um, I think we have a very good tool to work on, is to, to explain and to change the narrative from who is losing out towards one that clearly says the change is out there. So if you look at countries that face desertification, if you look at countries that have continuous floods, by the way, we also had that last summer in Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands. If you lose, look at how this affects people's lives, it is very clear the change is there and it's going to come anyways and it will be bigger. And the question that we face right now is are we just trying to somehow survive this change? Or will we use this moment to put ourselves in the driver's seat, in the driver's seat when it comes to adaptation, but also when it comes to transformation? And this is very much um, the perspective that I would like to see our for EU foreign policy to adopt full heartedly. And what is absolutely clear, and that will be another challenge for the next years, is we can step into this void and we be can become this superpower. Um, when it comes to promoting a global um, transformation and a global transformation agenda, especially if we do it as Team Europe. So if we align the um, foreign policies of the 27 EU member states with that one of the EU, because every time we do that, and we have seen that in trade and in setting standards, global standards, for example, in the area of digital and data protection, we have been successful as the European Union. We have been able to take others on board and to improve the situation in the world in these um, areas. And I really hope we can have equally ambitious um, agenda for our foreign policy. The German Minister of Foreign Affairs will be agreeing. I'm sure there will be more coming. The Finnish one is already one. But I also know that in other political parties across the spectrum, there is a lot of appetite in really making sure that we have climate justice and everyone lives up to the Paris goals. So, not much for now. And now I think I'm very happy to hand over to Jennifer, who has put a lot of food for thought of how we can reach all these ambitions that I have just outlined. Yes, thank you. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, especially also that point at the end that we do have more Greens who are occupying foreign ministry posts, which is not something that we could have said even uh, uh, last year, I imagine. Um, Jenny, please take it ahead uh, and give us your summary of, of the report. And I think we're going to have some slides flashing up, too. 
definitely bringing up the slides now um too fast if you can't see them but essentially we were very happy to take on the commission for this report because we felt it was immensely timely and i think that is even more so the case looking at both the processes and the potential that cop 26 set up but also the immense gaps in actually getting us onto a climate safe pathway that the cop 26 and the movement and occasionally lack of movement by countries around it has highlighted so this is very much kind of our, our answer to some of the problems that we see arising. Uh, right from the start, I wanna say that I co-authored this report with Leah Pilsner, who sadly can't join us today as she is ill, but was very much, this is very much a joint brainchild, not just of us, but of a large group of people. Um, to get a bit more into that, um, I just briefly wanted to start by just letting you know the approach and where this report is coming from. Um, so it was really an effort to assess the state of play of climate in EU external action, noting that external action is so broad and we have so many tools and levers that we could be using to advance climate action and supporting partners in, in doing more to achieve the common goals of the Paris Agreement. So we really went into this assessing where is the EU already integrating climate into its external action? So not just climate diplomacy, but climate and security, climate and development. And what leadership areas should we be building on? We were also really trying to assess what are the gaps? And then finally, what are others doing? How are China, the US, the UK, how are they positioning themselves uh, when it comes to climate and their foreign policy? And the big takeaway that we had there was that particularly from China and the US, we are seeing them center climate in their foreign policy, but it is not always with, with as broad a kind of co-development cooperation for the world rather than just for their own resources approach. And that's really where we see the potential for the EU to have a different approach, a uniquely European approach. Um, and one of the kind of considered, but, but ultimately not gone with titles for this report was actually cooperation superpower. So really this idea of what is the uniquely European offer to the world? Um, finally, we were we were really clear that we couldn't just do this ourselves, um, because what we really need at this point is a conversation with many experts to actually start looking at what are the different ways of doing this, because this is a big transformative pitch and there won't be kind of a one silver bullet solution to it. So one of the things that was really important for us going into this report was really bringing together foreign policy development, finance and climate diplomacy experts around roundtables. Now we did that in a roundtable, bringing together kind of 15 European organizations across all of the relevant fields, as well as benefiting from really generous review and feedback by over 20 European organizations. And the full acknowledgements list is in the report, but we didn't want to put them on the spot in these slides. Um, and that is really what we drew from to create both a longer term strategic framework. How do you even Paris align foreign policy? What are the guiding principles that you should be thinking through to create something with a bit of legs, a bit of life? And then a very concrete, if you were serious about halving global emissions in the next decade, about building resilience, about making the multilateral system fit for a climate changed world, what is the fast start program that you would invest in? And here we really challenged ourselves for something that was transformative, but fit for purpose, fit for the purpose of delivering Paris alignment, climate action as one of the central priorities of EU external action. Now, in terms of why we think anybody should care about this, why we think anybody should care about having to like fundamentally restructure EU external action in the way that we're fundamentally restructuring EU domestic action through our Green Deal, we think there are some pretty compelling stats and, and these are some of them. Um, so it's really clear that the emission gap is still very significant. We're at about 2.7 degrees Celsius currently from implemented policies, we could get that down onto a pathway of around 1.8 degrees Celsius. 1.5 is considered the, the safer end of the spectrum. Um, if all net zero policies that occur, if all net zero pledges that exist in the world were actually translated into policies, but that is a big if, and a big if that we know the EU is already working on. This is really the task for the next decade. Can we get onto something that looks more like a 1.5 aligned scenario that actually is the pathway for a climate just world for all? not just those who can afford it. Um, secondly, climate displacement. We are seeing an increased number of, of climate related impacts causing displacement. And actually in 2020, it was three times as much as any displacement caused by conflict or violence. So this is really destroying social structures, communities across the world. Uh, and it means that it is inherently a foreign insecurity challenge um, as well as a development challenge. 
we also note that there is still a huge climate finance gap now. Right now, that gap is about 20 billion, or at least that's what it was in 2019. Essentially, rich, rich countries have promised to provide 100 billion per year from 2020 to 2025. We have fallen short on that pledge, certainly in 2019, likely in 2020. But looking forward to this decade, the IEA, World Bank and um, World Economic Forum estimate that the gap is actually going to be, the need is actually going to be closer to one trillion just for emerging and developing economies to actually, you know, be able to invest in clean energy transition by 2030. That is a huge gap and that can't just come from the EU budget, but it does require countries like the EU to get engaged in, in some of the financial solutions with, with development banks, with others to actually do something about this because unaddressed this gap kills all opportunity, kills all chance of getting to 1.5. Um, and a final one kind of on this slide to really think about is petro states. These are states that are highly reliant on oil and gas revenues that are going to be hit by the global transition. And we are seeing a global transition emerge driven by the G7 countries who are now all committed to climate neutrality pathways. But 21 out of 40 petro states, many of them low income countries, some of them least developed countries, are projected to lose more than 60% of their government revenue over the next 20 years. That is a fiscal collapse waiting to happen. And if that isn't a development challenge, I don't know what is. And in certain areas, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, it's certainly a sort of security challenge, a security challenge. Some other considerations, we also have a huge adaptation finance gap. Um, Hannah mentioned the vast flooding that struck us here in Europe, in, in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands over the summer. Um, now, part of that is, is loss and damage. We, we certainly kind of experienced losses and damages due to climate change, but I'm from an area very close to where the flooding happened. And one of the reasons why we were lucky is because our local government was able to invest in adaptation measures, was able to rebuild river channels to be able to withstand flooding, and therefore we were left safe while our neighbours were not. But it really shows that having the funds to actually invest in adaptation is a matter of, of occasionally life and death, but certainly of impacting livelihoods and closing the adaptation finance gap, which is currently really only providing, you know, one fifth of the finance that we need at best for adaptation needs, particularly in developing countries, um, does need to be a priority moving forward if we truly believe in, in sustainable development, because this is undermining sustainable development on a daily basis. More broadly, investment in climate, others are starting to invest in climate. That is a real positive. We have actually also seen China committing to shift some of its portfolio to greener development. We will need to see how much of that is rhetoric and how much of that is delivery. But the reality is we are on green occasionally being outspent, which is silly because the EU is the world's largest development finance provider. So why isn't that money going into the co-benefits of climate and development? Um, and finally, we have a vested interest at home in actually making sure that the world transitions. We're going to have huge cohesion risks within the EU because climate impacts will be hitting us differently and different EU countries even have different capacity to, to deal with the climate impacts that are already devastating many of our cultural heritage sites, our national parks, our communities. Um, and finally, the public is behind it. Climate was identified as the single most serious problem facing this world by the European public. Why is it not the, the highest priority or at least one of the highest priorities in EU external action, not just rhetorically, where it is already very firmly seated, but in terms of the capacity, the staffing, the funding that we put behind it. Now, I promised you a strategic framework and some concrete suggestions. We're going to go straight into those and then I'm really keen for some discussion in terms of how to even think about transforming your external action for Paris alignment, we felt that there were four pillars that you needed to be thinking about, four principles. The first principle was aligning. We need to be ensuring that every aspect of EU foreign policy supports the implementation of the Paris, Paris Agreement. This includes things like getting rid of unhelpful kind of international investment in fossil fuel infrastructure. Why are we spending on things that we will have to kind of help transition out of in, in 15 to 20 years time? We need to be fostering synergies between all EU policies, and that means not funding things that go counter to the common, the universal agreement that is the Paris goals. Secondly, we need to co-develop. I think the thing that has the potential to set the EU apart from countries like the US, occasionally from countries like China, is making the best offer in a turbulent geopolitical landscape by really prioritizing dialogue and partnership. 
around this shared goal of climate safe world. So that means not just going out and saying, this is our green deal, do it the same way. It's saying, these are the challenges and opportunities that we're seeing. This is how we're facing them. How does that mirror your experiences? What can we do together? What are you already planning and how can we scale that up? And having that dialogue and investing in that dialogue, that is something that the EU really has the capacity to do, but is not doing consistently yet across its external action, particularly into African nations. Um, the third one is support. We need to be helping countries who have already committed to ambitious climate mitigation and adaptation goals actually achieve them. We need to be bridging that gap between net zero commitments and the policies that actually implement them, not just in terms of the technical assistance to create the enabling environment, the policies for that, that is obviously also important and part of the package, but also in mobilizing the funds that will be needed. We need one trillion for those developing and emerging economies for their clean energy transition. Are we going to be an actor of change in helping to, to kind of get that money flowing internationally, not just from the EU budget, but from things like the World Bank, like regional multilateral development banks? And finally, protect. And this is protect in two senses. It's on the one hand, really protecting EU values around equality, gender equality, human rights, and an increasingly climate impacted and multipolar world. But, is also, but it is also not being blue eyed and saying, look, we also have some economic interest here. We have some economic interest in making sure that the partners that we trade with, the, the partners who host the supply chains that, that are meant to be supplying our green technologies come along in this transition. Um, because we are also not blue eyed about the fact that the foreign policy community isn't going to prioritize this if, if there isn't some self-interest involved. And we think there's a very strong case for that self-interest, both in terms of the EU's own national security, but also in terms of the economic partnerships that we can build. Um, and we've definitely seen this narrative being picked up very strongly in the global gateway, but, but being realistic about what that takes. Now, that has resulted in a set of very crunchy propositions that um, are transformative, that are what we think it takes at a bare minimum to actually see the EU position itself as the leading actor in supporting other nations in their climate development, their, their climate transition um, over the next decade. This is a big pitch, but we felt a big pitch was necessary. It's clear that the EU has been improving its climate diplomacy, improving its climate outreach for the past five years. The EU really has been has had a phenomenal track record since Paris. But climate diplomacy is not the same thing as all that transformation of your external action. And if we're gonna see a shift in the pace of climate action, we need to see a shift in the pace of climate diplomacy. And this is really what we're proposing. Now, the first under the category of align is we need to be putting the humans, the diplomatic capacity behind the priority that we're giving climate action. We need a climate core. Um, so this is partly more dedicated humans who, who work with people like Mark um, and around Mark to, to deliver some of these things, to help with the mainstreaming, to also help EU fund managers actually think about what climate means for their projects and how they may need to change. And part of that will need to be new hires, but a lot of it will also need to be training. We need a climate certification training so that we just improve the literacy and the ability of existing EU staff to actually deal with this. So it's not just a box ticking exercise, it's actually a new approach. The second is, as much as we, we very, very much appreciate the work that Mark does, it's really clear that if the EU is going to hold relationships at Minister of Economy level, we need somebody whose full-time job it is to put some weight behind something like a global gateway and build the co-development relationships that we need. This is somebody who, who has all of his capacity to do just that, uh, because right now we have four commissioners put behind a global gateway with, what, 5% of their job, 2% of their job? And that is going to certainly lend political credibility, but you need a person whose full-time job it is to deliver and you probably need a team behind that person working on this more transformational, more economic, more co-development action. Um, the third one is we really need to be leveraging Parliament's budgetary oversight. Um, we have a process where the Parliament gets to kind of approve of, of how the budget is being spent. And we think that part of what is needed to make the parliament better able to assess whether we are aligning all of our funding with the goals of the Paris Agreement is a state of EU external climate action report. You would not imagine when we were pulling together this report how difficult it was to get to some of these numbers, to even just have a sense of how much money is actually already climate earmarked, how many humans actually work on something international around climate across the commission. We need some of this information in an annual report that allows us all to get a sense of are we transitioning are we transforming fast enough 
Um, and I think that would be an invaluable resource to, to everybody working on this topic. It could also be a great place to have a regular assessment of what other countries are doing. How does the EU stay, become, remain the best offer for partners? What is China doing? What is the US doing? Really that foresight ability. And that is the place where we would see that happening. And then finally, in the category of align, we need to get ministers that aren't just environment ministers talking about this more regularly. The January Foreign Affairs Council was a really amazing first step in this direction. But we really feel that there needs, if we're actually going to invest in this sort of a transformational fast start action, we're going to need a regular dialogue between foreign affairs, environment, development and economy ministers to actually give the EU 27 buy-in. Because we know it's when EU member states align their work with what the commission, what EU institutions, what EU financial institutions are doing, that we have the most impact in the world. Now, this could be underpinned by a preparatory group similar to what we currently have in Corepa. Apologies for going Brussels geeky on you for a sec. I promise I'll stop. Um, but essentially, it would require something like the, the kind of leads in the perm reps and their climate attaches regularly preparing this sort of a dialogue. When it comes to co-development, we do see but there is promise in the Global Gateway Initiative that has really been fleshed out last week to become that beacon of the European offer to co-develop just green and resilient recovery and development pathways. But what we're missing right now is the delivery mechanisms that underpin that really promising rhetoric. The first couple of delivery mechanisms that we see as vital here is establish and staff a central Global Gateway hub, potentially under this climate implementation envoy. We really need a team whose main job is mainstreaming this thing. So something like the Global Gateway doesn't just become a nice new label to attach to existing EU projects, but we actually have a strategic rethink of where this money is going. Um, and also that this is the forum that can really develop those sustained dialogues with partners. One of the biggest criticisms that we've heard of EU external action is that for a lot of partners who aren't the US or China, it's a boom and bust cycle of EU summits and then silence. Um, that is a I'm, I'm being quite blunt about this, but we need a format that can create those sustained dialogues if we're actually going to co-develop solutions rather than just pitch something EU-shaped into a summit. And this is really what we see being able to do that. We need to be investing as much in green transition abroad as at home. So currently we invest about 30% of the EU budget at home. That's 360 billion. The EU, uh, the commission has last week proposed 300 billion for the Global Gateway. We think that is definitely like the very baseline of what would actually need to be mobilized. There are questions around whether that is new money. I think the bigger question is, is it strategically used money? Is it going to be flowing into new projects or just, again, putting a new label on existing projects? But that is a conversation we need to have. Are we investing as much in the 91% as we are in the 9% when it comes to actually reducing emissions? And then the final two, we really need to be leveraging the existing experience of the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction Development. They don't have the best track record on adaptation, I will say that, but they have excellent track records when it comes to actually integrating climate into their portfolios in terms of mitigation activities. And we need to be leveraging that and their ability to also engage with other big financial institutions, because not all of this money can come from EU households. And finally, we need to be integrating human rights and gender equality considerations into the co-development dialogues. If we care about this, if we think the partners care about this or should care about this, there needs to be a dialogue around it rather than just a blunt conditionality. Um, but that does probably need to be complemented by due diligence processes. There are certain situations or projects that we probably shouldn't be investing in as the EU if there are gross human rights abuses attached to them. Finally, uh, the final two, and then I am keen to hear from our respondents because I'm aware this is a comprehensive package of actions, um, is one on the support pillar, really thinking through what are the new things that we want to be supporting? What are the things that we need to be investing in a lot more strategically with things like the Global Gateway Initiative? Um, our pitch would certainly be you need to be investing in one, major emerging economies, because that is where a lot of the emissions reductions are to be had, and they are the ones who, at COP26 and, and around it, have shown themselves to be most skeptical about their ability to actually transition. I think the, the South Africa deal here, the, the Just um, Energy Transition Partnership, is a very interesting one. It still needs to be implemented, but it is certainly an interesting model around a dialogue that has resulted in a plan for shifting from coal to clean. We need to be having more of these dialogues with major emerging economies, because that is really where halving the emissions can happen this decade. But those dialogues need to be happening in the next year, the next two years, ideally ahead of COP27. At the same time, we need to be working with least developed and middle income petro states. They are at huge risk. They are a huge risk. 
And therefore, we need to be investing in their clean and resilient development pathways and economic diversification pathways. Um, and that means striking up dialogues now. Um, we are aware that a lot of the focus of the Global Gateway is currently obviously on the Indo-Pacific, and it is clear that the EU does have some strategic interest in the region. And there is a lot of geopolitical uh, dynamics unfolding in that region between the US, China, India, Japan. And the EU, EU has, has a role to play in that area, but we think that there also needs to be a much greater focus on the areas where the EU has the most influence and the most ability to actually help impactful climate transitions. And for us, that's the EU neighbourhood, it's the Eastern Mediterranean, and it's Africa. And really having a plan for those areas as a priority, we, we think is, is a big part of this. Across all of this, particularly when it comes to the petro states, the engagement shouldn't just be focused on their green transitions, but also on peace building and managing risks around climate impacts, fragility, fiscal vulnerability and social tipping points, because some of these states are, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, are, are countries where we are actively already engaging on these things, but completely separate or, or only kind of slightly integrated around the climate issue. And then very finally, um, the last set of recommendations that we have is around this conversation of protecting. Now, part of protecting is prioritizing resilience and adaptation. We're starting to do that a bit more domestically, but we cannot currently say that it is a clear priority across our external action and that we're investing accordingly. So that is partly consistently addressing climate in the EU strategic compass. Uh, we are already really glad to see climate being a big topic for the EU strategic compass, the big new guiding foreign policy security strategy. But it is not consistently integrated. And I think particularly the foresight needed, the foresight capacity, the ability to know what the new risks are around climate could be strengthened. It's also looking at COP26 and what we learned from it, increasing our public finance for adaptation. The, the clear ask from the UNSG and others is that it should equal public funding for mitigation, simply because it is not an area where private finance floods to. You just don't get a good return on investment from a seawall. Um, so, Adaptation needs equal treatment when it comes to public finance. And then we need to be looking at what formats we can use to identify joint diplomatic priorities with, with our partners, um, particularly looking at using development formats like the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific Partners formats to actually talk about what is the change that we need to see in things like the IMF or MDBs to actually make them fit for investing in resilience, because right now they're not but it is a conversation where joint priorities with, with vulnerable country partners would be critical. Across all of this, we need to be stepping back and also thinking about the fact that while we're asking for more money for climate, what we're also asking for is more money that looks at the cross, like the, the co-benefits of gender equality, human rights, development and climate as interlinked objectives, as objectives that are not possible if they are not thought through collectively. And one of the first ways that we could go about that is earmarking funds for cross-cutting projects. And then finally, um, obviously, we have immense market power. We, we are the largest market in the world, and we should be leveraging that in the EU's relationships with key trading partners um, to really look at how we can build that climate-ready international economic system. Now, three concrete priorities for the economic diplomacy side of things. One is we need to be deepening existing transition and climate risk dialogues with G20 major fossil producers. So the Russia's, the Turkey's, the Saudi Arabia's and the USA is realistically of this world. Now, a lot of that is already happening, but really staying invested in those spaces, I think, will be very important. The second is we are increasingly seeing the G7 get behind climate neutrality. So we need to really jump and invest in those areas of joint alignment and market power to accelerate the deployment of the green technologies that we need but also critically align standards so that as we roll out new green technologies, as we, as we kind of all move along in the transition, we're building markets rather than closing them down. Um, and then finally, EU-China is going to remain a really complex relationship because we will have to both cooperate with them. They are quite simply put the largest emitter in the world. Every second coal plant in the world is in China, but we will also be competing with them, both geopolitically, but also on things like standards and lead markets for new green technologies. So we need to be prepared for that. And that may become a model to engage with other countries that we have less, um, less of a values alignment on in terms of having to both cooperate and compete. Now that is a lot, but we think a lot is needed. 
to see the EU move from being a good climate diplomacy actor to actually being a driver for change, a driver for cooperation in this world. And these are some concrete propositions that we see as the start of that conversation. Um, looking forward to hearing what, what others think, where more might be needed, um, and what you see as priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was very, very comprehensive and perhaps um, the most comprehensive take uh, on this topic that we've seen so far, because as you said, it's bringing together lots of burgeoning elements that we know the EU wants to do and does care about. We now have two respondents um, and I'm going to give you both about three to five minutes to give your initial thoughts. Um, Hannah Ryder, why don't we start with you? Um, uh, perhaps you've picked up on a couple of themes of this, some comments you want to make. Um, your the, um, the mic is yours, as it were. Thank you so much, Mirren, and uh, and thank you also to uh, my namesake Hannah and uh, and Jennifer also for their for their um, for their sharing of this report and and commissioning getting it done. Um, I think it's very important, very useful, good for. Um, it's very good to be able to kind of take this big picture um, analysis and think about what's what's the way forward. Um, I in particular, and let me just give you a little bit of, of, of background about where, I'm, where I'll be coming from. Um, and I run an international development consultancy called Development Reimagined. Um, we are uh, headquartered in China with smaller offices in Kenya and the UK. Um, we're an African-led international development consultancy. So what our work often, and in particular, more, more recently with the China-Africa uh, conference that's just taken place, really consists of trying to encourage and understand where um, African nations are coming from in terms of what their relationship, what they would like from their relationship uh, with, with the continent and looking at with, with China in particular. Um, however, this is obviously a very important, um, uh, it's also important to think about this in the context of the EU. How do African um, countries also get what they would like um, from partnership with the EU? Uh, and also uh, in terms of the partnership on climate change, how do, how do uh, African economies work with others in order to, to drive that? Now we know that, and so I will talk in particular about, uh, about yeah, an, Af an African perspective, I guess, on this. Um, we know that many African countries are very ambitious on climate change, um, despite the fact that they are facing some really significant um, challenges uh, having and, and that they are uh, also already behind in terms of development and things like energy access. So I really welcome the focus by E3G on, on the importance of structural and transformational changes, because I think in terms of the right kind of outcomes, incremental change, and this is a key, this is a key message, incremental change is not going to deliver. Um, but the Again, it's very the reason why um, I bring up working uh, with working on Africa-China relations is that the biggest challenge to foreign policy, EU foreign policy, I think, um, is one how to get Europe's home in order, and two how to help Europeans. And I mean, European citizens understand the need for global public finance flows. Some people call it global public investment, and I'm, on, I'm a group that talks about public, global um, public investment, but effectively public financial flows. And, and I think this is, this is very important to understand because however positive a European policy might be and whatever, whatever processes you put in place to have a very positive European climate policy, the issues around what you actually do at home and how you uh, how finance flows will always um, get in the way. The being a role model part, the getting the home in order, being a role model is very important. Um, otherwise, there is a risk of being accused of hypocrisy, and we've, we've seen that at COP twenty six um, and coming out of COP twenty six with this idea, you know, can countries use coal? Can countries use gas? And actually, you know, European countries still plan to, etc. Um, and the idea of kind of doing as I say, not as I do, um, really puts a break on any ambition with regards to foreign policy. So I think in that kind of context, you know, 
ideas of things like border adjustments can be really difficult and and I think will effectively just look anti-competitive in some way. So I think it's very important to take that very seriously and look at what transformation also means at home. And I think that's not quite um, clear in the report at the minute, but um, I think it still matters um, beyond beyond what's in the what's in the report. Um, and then this, the second point of um, uh, about global public finance flows, and I think, and the report does bring this out a lot more. I think um, is is how how can whether for adaptation finance, mitigation finance, how can that finance be increased bilaterally or through the multilaterals without conditions? Um, and in particular, because mainstreaming or um, climate tracking at the same time as cutting aid budgets is very, very problem problematic for recipient countries. Um, it makes it more likely that any support is going to be smaller impact, less transformational, um, and while, of course, you know, from an external perspective or from an internal perspective, the EU often feels, you know, Europe, Europe, European countries often feel quite happy with the fact that they're giving aid and so on, you know, 0.5, etc. But even at those levels, it's still not keeping up with economic or population growth in other countries and the conditions make it worse. If you put conditions on, on finance, um, they can actually hold back progress rather than um, rather than improve them. So I think those two broad issues, while you know again fully endorse all of the suggestions from 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 E3G in terms of um, improving the processes, aiming for that structural transformational change rather than incrementalism, um, absolutely crucial. But you've got to remember those two issues in mind also are very important to be able to. Um, in part to European citizens, European parliamentarians, um, and others who are who are making decisions and trying to trying to do the right thing, um, these are also very important to think through. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and Mark, finally, as, as someone who is, I, I guess, a relative insider, there was a lot in this report which involved putting more resources into the sort of departments you work at, maybe having more versions of you too. Perhaps you could give us a couple of your thoughts on um, initial thoughts on on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, uh, and thank you to Jennifer and E3G uh, for this report, which you know, is a, an in-depth analysis uh, of what could be done. I mean, 50 pages, uh, which I've gone through once only. Um, and so my remarks are going to be preliminary as well as personal, because quite a number of the things that uh, are put forward are very political and uh, actually uh, require a response from the Commission rather than from a civil servant. Um, having said that, um, let me perhaps uh, make a few comments on the basis of the, the sort of four uh, components that are in uh, the report, the align, um, co-develop, um, support and protect. Now, with regard to staffing, with regard to human resources, I mean, um, Obviously, I'm the last one to say that we shouldn't get more resources uh, for climate diplomacy. Um, on the other hand, of course, we have to um, stand the test of confrontation with reality. And the reality is that there was also other um, domains that claim more resources. Um, if I look at uh, what we do in the, in, the, in the global department of the European External Action Service, I mean, there there is migration, there is cyber, uh, there is uh, trade, um, there is human rights. Um, so quite a number of areas and green uh, is, is definitely a, a big chunk of that, but uh, there is competition for limited resources. Right now in the years, we have um, five full-time equivalents working on climate. Uh, two years and a half ago, we were two. So there is already quite an increase. And if everything goes according to plan, we may actually get to seven uh, in a not too distant future. If I look at the whole um, set of human resources uh, in the EAS and in the commission working on international climate issues, 
So in climate, in energy, in uh, international partnerships, and I add the ones that I've just mentioned for the EES, we may get to something like 20, 20 full-time equivalents. Um, that's probably not very much, but that is what it is. Uh, and we, we've got to push that up that number. Um, of course, that's not the only thing we need to do. As you said yourself, we have to make all our diplomats more climate literate. Uh, right now, there are quite a number of our people in the, uh, what is it, 140 delegations we have in the world who are uh, quite expert at climate matters, but those are what I would call hobbyists. They do it uh, because of the fact that they are very attached to the subject. Um, we are now putting in place seminars uh, and our uh, training seminars um, for our staff uh, in headquarters and delegations. And to give you one example, we have already done two seminars post Glasgow for our 140 delegations. So that they're all um, uh, you know, put uh, at a certain level with regard to the knowledge they should have. Um, you also come up with this idea of a, uh, uh, a climate implementation envoy. There, I would uh, say, watch out what you wish for. Um, this can only work if that person is a commissioner. The last thing we need is a third poli political person um, who would then become the implementation envoy, but would not be part of the commission because that person will have to work with the commission staff. And those people will then be in a very difficult position because they are on the one hand accountable to the commission. I mean, that's in a way what a commission civil servant has to do. Uh, if you then have another person outside the commission, uh, that is going to lead to far more tension than to um, concrete, um, useful addition to the workforce. Um, the, uh, what you could perhaps envisage is a senior official, um, preferably because it's implementation uh, in uh, Director General Klima. I mean, they have just gone through a reorganization which will, be, which will become operational on the 16th of January of next year. Let's see how this can uh, fit in. But to have uh, from the outside an implementation SAR uh, that is, uh, I think, going to complicate it rather than uh, expedite matters. Um, what else could I say? Well, on the, on the finance issue, of course, we know there has got to be uh, more money, um, but uh, it's not going to be an obvious proposition. Um, currently, um, we set aside 30 to 35 percent of the Ndiki money for climate related purposes. Um, we're now going through the programming cycle of that money. Uh, I can also tell you that some of our beneficiary countries are not exactly very enthusiastic about this because they would love to have also money for public health, education, infrastructure, whatnot. Uh, and so you're also going to have a, um, a discussion with them uh, how, to, how to use that money. Um, it's clear that um, uh, we need to get now to the climate finance of $100 billion. We should be getting there in 2022. The EU, together with the member states, uh, generate about $28 billion a year. Obviously, that is a lot in loans and not enough in grants. Um, so the, the, the climate finance question is there. The question is, how, uh, where are we going to find the money? Uh, especially in, a, in, a, in an EU budget which has a seven-year span, so the envelopes have already been given. Topping that up is not going to be an obvious proposition. Um, moreover, uh, we know that uh, although the 100 billion are very important, uh, especially from a political symbolic point of view, uh, as you said yourself, uh, Jennifer, um, what we need to have is not the billions, but the trillions. And so the big issue will be, how can we incentivize uh, international capital markets to invest more 
uh, in developing countries for climate mitigation and adaptation purposes. The question has been put very often already. I haven't seen yet an answer that um, uh, is um, uh, very, very effective, uh, but we'll have to work on that. Uh, we are currently trying that now with, uh, with South Africa with this Just Energy Transition Partnership. Let's see how that pans out. Uh, it's essentially about de-risking capital through our finance institutions. The finance institutions that indeed need to be mobilized more, but also there we have to have the intellectual honesty to say uh, that uh, although indeed MDBs can do more, it's also true that they say, listen, we can stretch our balance sheets only to a certain extent. After a while, you need to put also more capital in those development banks. Uh, will that be something that um, our public opinion, our politicians uh, are prepared to do? Um, finally, because I mean, we can go on about it for a very long time, uh, but I only have been given five minutes and perhaps I've already overrun that uh, five minutes. With regard to the various aspects you're raising uh, on uh, what a climate diplomacy should be doing, I think you have ticked many boxes, most of the boxes, but not all the boxes. Uh, there are two things I believe that uh, are uh, still missing in a way. We are working on that uh, together with our colleagues from uh, the industry departments uh, of the Commission, and that is you know, the geopolitics of uh, decarbonization. You have already mentioned the question of the petrol states and how can we uh, make sure that they um, you know, diversify themselves enough. One big issue we have to uh, look into is what is going to happen during the transition. You see a cut in demand for fossil fuels gradually, but because of the fact that we are now saying we're no longer going to invest in fossil fuel supply, you may be seeing a cut in fossil fuel supply, which is even steeper than the demand. And so what you're now seeing is that the energy price for quite a number of goods is going to go up um, as we are have been witnessing over the last few years. We've got to make sure that uh, this price increase, which may repeat itself, um, before in the end we fully exit from fossil fuels, uh, that this is managed because otherwise uh, in public opinion in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, you may see resistance against the decarbonization. So we've got to make sure that a decarbonization does not go hand in hand with very steep energy prices because otherwise resistance will build. The other thing that your report does not uh, cover fully is the whole question of making sure we have access to the raw materials of the future. We know that for wind, for solar, for uh, energy storage, we need a number of raw materials. These raw materials are more concentrated in the world than oil and gas. Lithium, 50% of production is now in Australia. Rare earth, three quarters of all the production of rare earth is in China. Cobalt, more than 50% of that is in one country, Congo. How do we make sure that we get into a, a conversation with those countries where uh, European industry, but also industry at large in the world gets a stable, predictable access for those or to those resources? Apart from that, I mean, again, you know, lots of, lots of interesting ideas. Uh, we need to digest your report. Uh, obviously, as uh, climate ambassador, I'm uh, very happy that you spend so much energy on this subject uh, and that uh, you give a push uh, to the need for more resources. I'm the last one to contradict you. Uh, but as I said, this is very much a political issue. Over Thank to you again, Marine. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think we're going to give um, Jenny a chance to come back and then I will maybe put some questions to all of us to get the debate going. But initially, um, um, uh, Jennifer, why don't you respond? Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the thoughtful comments on this um, and, and the fact that you did a slog through 50 pages. We promise the executive summary is much shorter and the infographics are very informational. Uh, so you can just skim those as well. Uh, but... Um, 
this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted a start of a conversation. Not everybody will agree with every recommendation, which is why we hope that there will be a flurry of similar reports so that we have a full menu of options to pick and choose from. This is what we felt a good first comprehensive package looks like. I think responding first to Hannah, I completely agree that there is a role model function. We, writing this report, we felt that you already very much understood the role model function that it played. And occasionally, sometimes too much effort was put just into role modeling and not enough into supporting others to find their own models. So we didn't emphasize that as much, but we fully agree. And obviously, particularly around things like the approach to gas, there will be many tests ahead for the EU um, in the next year. So excited to see how, how the EU chooses to role model um, its own transition moving forward and um, very much a pillar of the work. On the global public financial flows, I, I really hope that that is something that most people take away from this report. And I think both you and Mark spoke very powerfully to the need to really look at what we're willing to do in that space and the need for political will. I think we, if we're serious about this, we can't shy away from a conversation about recapitalizing uh, multilateral development banks, because while some of this can be done with private money and some of this will need to be done with private money, there needs to be a really strong, really reliable, really credible core a seed of public funding at the center of that. And that is a really tough conversation that I know we've been trying to have within the EU for a while now. And we'll continue to need to try and have for a while now, not just within the EU, but also with partners like the US, partners, partners like the UK. And um, so the German G7 will be very interesting for, for that conversation as well. But it is clear that that is needed as a strong core of all of this. Um, and then maybe finally, two, two quick reactions just to Mark. I think one on the critical raw materials, we fully agree with you. We just felt that we already had such a strong package and you're already doing quite a lot on it that we felt you were well, you had a good track on that and we didn't necessarily need to point towards it. Um, but if you would like to add it, um, that would be fantastic. And then secondly, when it comes to the staffing and the capacity behind this, we always knew this would be quite political. And A, I really hope that a number of us were taking notes because I feel like you already gave us the foundations for that state of external climate action report. So we can kind of jot in, OK, it's about 20 people um, and there are some seminars ongoing. We'd love to see that in like an annual fashion so that we just know exactly what's going on. Um, and secondly, when it comes to the Climate Implementation Envoy, there will be very different views about this because it is deeply political. But our strong opinion was that if you're actually going to engage at ministerial level with econ ministries of economy and planning, you can't just send a senior official. You just can't. The conversations about how that person would be anchored into the College of Commissioners, what set of commissioners they might need to report to, whether it is kind of a reporting to the EVP sort of structure, that is a very relevant conversation to have so that they're not just a free-floating menace on the cohesion of, of the commission. But I think the idea that this can be sorted at senior official level when we know the challenges that we face, particularly in some of the major emerging economies, I don't see that as being, I, I see that as being an interesting step, but very much a marginal step. I think being serious about this will require some institutional reform. And I'm keen to see whether we can engage in that partly in this webinar, but partly also offline with, with some other experts as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, maybe I'll zoom out now and, and perhaps a question to Hannah Neumann, uh, and which everyone can jump into. But, you know, just from my initial readings and also following, following um, EU climate diplomacy and foreign policy for a few years, I mean, I want to ask why anyone on this panel thinks the EU is a credible foreign policy actor and a credible actor to do this type of climate diplomacy. I mean, having followed um, uh, some of the more recent themes around EU foreign policy, they've been very little in terms of success. And the one issue that hasn't been mentioned is not really mentioned in the report is migration. Um, and if there's one overarching priority which has defined um, the EU's uh, relationship with its near neighbourhood, it's about controlling mig migration flows. Um, that is where there is a huge political priority at every EU uh, summit. That's where the money is going. That's where visits to near neighbourhood countries from Egypt to Turkey, etc. go on. And it's also perhaps I think poison the well for many countries because they are only ever seen as a potential um, threat in terms of making sure that people do not enter the EU and if they do they have to find their ways back. So Hannah Neumann um, maybe you can speak on this point because I think um, this credibility issue is not one that I think has been uh, that we can say the EU is, is standing on secure ground because I think many people would question it and I think many people in third countries will also question the EU's credibility to be this kind of climate superpower and this norm spreader when actually um, I mean, on the ground, it's doing things that are very much about self-interest and usually very little about what these countries want to achieve, um, especially when it comes to their people arriving on the EU's borders. Maybe you can speak to that point. And then anyone else who wants to jump in, please do. 
Well, thank you, Maureen, for, for coming in with this highly political question. Um, I, and, and, and the answer is a bit two-sided, and I'm sure Mark can complement on that one. So first of all, why do I think uh, the European Union is a credible actor? It stems clearly from the multilateral approach that the European Union also being not one country, but being kind of a multilateral um, actor itself, and for, because of its strong commitment to all these multilateral issues, including human rights and others in the interna international fora has built, there is some credibility that not as much as we see it, especially with China, but also to some degree with the US and even more so with Russia and other big countries. Um, European Union actually is not perceived as much and guided by, by self-interest. At least that's the impression I have also when reaching out to partners in, in the Gulf area, for example. Um, also, and, and that may refer especially to, to what, what Hannah um, has been focusing on the African continent, the European Union as a whole, much more than individual member states, is there also perceived as a, as a more neutral actor um, and more is more welcome because it doesn't have these colonial ties, legacies, problems, issues that France in some area has, Belgium in other areas has, and other European Union um, countries. Also, what, what has been very clear that the European Union, with um, all the money that has previously gone into international co uh, cooperation, but also into humanitarian aid, I really think has been a strong donor. Um, and has been a donor that most of the time has committed um, to, to the goals and ambitious ambition it has had when it came to, comes to international cooperation and humanitarian aid. I also think that there is, is some hope that the European Union will be able to leverage um, capital, so to have a considerable amount of money, and that will help countries in their transformation and the announcement of the European Union Action, Action Service and Josep Borrell when it comes to the European Investment Bank that will mainly be spending on transformative agenda, I think also has raised some, some expectations, but also promises there. What would be key for the European Union to be able to capitalize in the future on this reputation is clearly to align its own policies. You spoke about migration. Let me make a few points on migration later on, but also to align its trade policies, for example, with these goals. So when it comes to, to trade agreements, we should make sure that they don't have just a clauses on social standards, but also on climate aspects, which is something in the European Parliament we are pushing for very hard, but also to check the existing trade agreements, whether or not they actually support a Paris-aligned agenda. So when it comes to subsidies for the agriculture, for example, um, it is highly problematic if we continue to support large-scale farming, which compromises a lot on biodiversity, for example, rather than going back to supporting smaller and companies, but also to bolster just international trade where we could have local um, value chains in the European Union as well as in, 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 in the other countries. So here really it, it will be key that we align our different foreign policies and um, behind this goal to reach credibility. And the migration issue is is a core cool one and it, it will be key in this debate not just because of um, the conditionality that has been built around the migration issues especially with the countries in north africa in the past which i think has been detrimental um, to our agenda not just on climate but also our credibility when it comes to human rights and others and I'm very happy that with the new EU budget, at least for the European Union, the problem is not all member states aligned to that, but at least for the EU budget, we make sure that there is no migration conditionality um, in, in any of the international cooperation. Um, and we will um, closely check um, that the European Union will live up to this one. But the other issue of migration that we have to deal with, and we hope we can slowly push our partners of other political parties, but especially the Commission, to give more thought into that is what we do with the large migration influx that we will see globally. And we cannot just walk away from that as the European Union as a result of the climate change and the climate crisis that is happening already. 
So we are looking at, and you know it better than me, islands um, being inhabitable, we are looking at more and more desertification. We are looking at large migration flows. And here we need a much more constructive approach as the European Union than the current one, which is basically closing all um, legal pathways into the Union. Anna Ryder, do you want to jump in on this subject too? I mean, I was I was nodding to, to that um, throughout. And in particular, I think this this point about that migration will um, there will be more migration globally um, due to climate change impacts. And so the EU does need to get ready a more uh, open position on that. Um, and I think and but I, I think there's also a few other broader points that I would make in terms of the credibility, um, because I think the, the EU has had a good reputation um, over the over the past kind of 20 or so years on, on climate change in particular, and especially during, in negotiations, um, having a very positive, fairly positive impact, look at Paris itself, um, but then also previous to that, um, you know, being amongst the first to take up uh, the 100 billion climate finance commitment back in 2009. Um, so, you know, it, it is, the EU has played a positive bridging role um, and in particular, in comparison, perhaps to some North American partners and so on, who um, have been less, uh, shall we say, forthcoming. Um, and I think given the geopolitical um, structures at the moment, um, that, that that can be expected to continue. Um, so, so I think it's, the EU has a potential to play a role. I think the problem at the moment is exactly what, what, what Hannah was just was mentioning, this kind of the challenge is, is that the other policies start to make a difference much more. And I'll also pick up a point just to kind of ram that, ram that home. Um, we'll talk about migration, but let's also talk about another one, which Mark was just was alluding to as well, talking about raw materials. Now, if you think about it from an African perspective, if you look at some of the African um, uh, kind of development documents, there's something called Gender 2063, um, similar to what the EU would have, a kind of overarching African Union, African perspective. This is where we want to go. And it has got six different frameworks. One is called the African Mining Vision, uh, and then also 15 flagship projects, some of which are hydro, some of which are kind of overarching regional infrastructure projects for transport, et cetera, et cetera, a lot. Even going into universities and, and kind of understanding anyway. Just to say there are similar structures on the African Union side, right? But the African mining vision in particular, it, it has potential to clash with what Mark was just talking about, securing access to raw materials. Because the African mining vision has got two key elements. One element is adding value in African countries rather than sending raw materials in their raw form to other countries. And the other aspect is high environmental and social standards. Now, how to make sure both of those remain an African priority, while perhaps the European Union might feel actually our priority is to secure access to raw materials. And securing access to raw materials, does the environmental stand, do the environmental and social standards matter? Do they, you know, a whole range of challenges. So this is what I mean about kind of getting things in order. It's, it's also about the policies and regulations which are kind of de decided at home within the EU, which then affect things like for flows of foreign direct investment, inward migration, flows of trade, inward trade, which make a huge difference to climate policy. And if, and if, if the EU's climate foreign policy is divorced in some way from any of those, that credibility will continue to be eroded. Thank you. And Mark, I know we're gonna, you're gonna leave us in a couple of minutes. So I wanna to go to you maybe to address the points about credibility. I mean, also, uh, I think this is theme will come to uh, as well, the CBAM. When you speak to countries um, in your capacity, I think the CBAM is perhaps the, probably the one that gets the most attention. It is obviously generated a lot of concern, some interest. There is no carve out for the LDCs in the commission's proposal. Um, is, so, you know, the commission, we were talking about approaches, but there's also a carrot and a stick. The CBAM probably does both. Um, how does it affect 
affect your work and when you cooperate with these countries uh, and what thoughts they give you about whether they can be captured by this mechanism and, and are they trying not to so is it working in that sense as a as a as a carrot as it were thank you marine i mean this question of credibility credibility is never absolute uh it's a relative concept um but i believe that when we compare ourselves to other big players in the world, we are by far the most credible with regard to climate. First of all, uh, we set the example. Uh, we, um, we have gone from our peak in 1990 to minus 23% now. We're now going to minus 55%. I think many people will consider that to be compatible with the Paris Agreement. There are many other countries in the world that have targets that are not yet in line with the Paris Agreement. We have also an extremely transparent system to get to the minus 55. We now have the 13 proposals for the fit for 55. Next week on the 14th of December, we'll have another set of proposals coming out to complete that package. There is no one in the world, no one, that has the same transparency, no one. Secondly, indeed, we have the power of the purse. We are the biggest donor in the world. And of that money, we're now setting aside one third for climate related purposes. I'd like to know who else does that. And thirdly, indeed, we are prepared to have environmental concerns come into the question of access to the internal market. Uh, we started with that uh, quite a number of years ago in the fishery sectors with the IUU, illegal and unreported um, and unregulated fishing. We are now uh, having the proposal on CBAM. Uh, two weeks ago, we came out with a proposal on deforestation. These are all aspects of the same sort of concept. We want to use the access to our internal market, our market to further non-economic objectives. Um, obviously, there has got to be uh, close attention paid to when is something legitimate from that point of view? And where do you get into green protectionism? I mean, as a former ambassador of the World Trade Organization, I know what I'm talking about. But for instance, with regard to CBAM, we took a lot, a lot of uh, time in order to devise a system that is non-discriminatory, where uh, indeed what we do is in line with WTO uh, rules. But CBAM, of course, CBAM does uh, not always receive applause in the rest of the world. But I can tell you one thing. It has made people sit up. Uh, when you talk about CBAM, um, it has now something or it has triggered a lot of interest into the subject. Um, and I think many people are now much more interested in the issue of introducing carbon pricing. The IMF, many others have been saying carbon pricing is the instrument to curb emissions. We have been doing that for 16 years. Um, and now we are building the external dimension of our emissions trading scheme, which is called CBA. Um, I understand very well what um, Hannah was saying that we've got to make sure that we don't get into green protectionism. I fully share her concern. But on the other hand, we also have to uh, put our actions where our concepts are. And uh, this idea of conditioning uh, the access to the internal market to a number of environmental concerns um, very much falls into that basket. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. I think you have to leave us now. Um, but thank you for joining us. It's been uh, it's been really great to hear from you. I think we're going to go to some questions next because I mean I was already going to raise the theme of the global gateway, but it's come up um, also in the questions and some sort of comments. And then maybe I'll, I'll read them out, and then the panelists can jump in. Um, Ignacio Aronis uh, has a, a, a question about the global gateway and says, um, "Who are the commissioners leading on this? Um, what are the what structures are there?" 
to work together uh, and what is the team being put behind it. He also adds that um, if Global Gateway becomes simply a tool to unlock EU access to new essential raw materials, it will fully and spectacularly fail. The EU should work to ensure partners add greater value to green supply chains and create space for their own sustainable development. Um, this means technology transfers, uh, capital building, new approaches to investment facilitation. The EU needs autonomous, strong, strong and committed partners for the transition, not um, neo-colonial neo colonies focused on extractive industries. Um, Rachel Simons also wants to know on the global gateway, to, she says to ensure success in the EU would do well to look at existing development country owned and led initiatives and how it can align support towards them rather than creating a new Eurocentric um, branded approach to development. I mean, just for those who are unfamiliar with Global Gateway, this was announced by um, President von der Leyen at the State of the Union speech last September. It's sort of been billed as the EU's alternative to Belt and Road, which is China's investment-led drive into Africa and the EU's neighbourhood. Um, I think von der Leyen and, and the Commission have said that um, they think they're in a much better position to talk to third countries about what they need because they're not China and they're not the US and they're more interested in, in having a, a deeper fulfilled relationship with these countries rather than just giving them money to build bridges. Um, we don't know too much about it beyond that. I mean, it's it's a proposal and it will be worked on in the normal ways and go through co-decisions. Um, but either one of you, Hannah or Jennifer, we have had some thoughts from the audience about, um, about what the Global Gateway should be. Of course, this word co-development is quite a big theme in the report. Um, Jennifer, Maybe you could tell us about what, you know, if somebody uh, try to unpack the word co-development and are there existing models for the EU doing this successfully in other areas that don't, are they not primarily about climate? Co-development is a learning process for us all. Um, I'll be very honest, like we, we talk extensively with organisations in the development area and in the foreign development and policy space, but I think I honestly think you should approach it like you would a G7 summit. You don't go it. You go in there with maybe a pitch and idea, but you go in there with a full understanding of where all of those countries are coming from because you know you can't force them to sign anything. And it's that idea of equal eye level conversation that is needs to be at the heart of it. This idea that you go in not just saying like, oh, I'm the German G7 presidency and Japan is going to sign up to this. You say probably Japan has its own plans. Maybe we should talk about what the commonalities are and what it means for what we do together. And I think that both, both Rachel's comment, but also Hannah Ryder's comment about the, for example, the Africa 2063 vision, engaging from the existing plans and saying, we really believe in supporting you with this deliverable of that plan. We really want to engage not just through our climate partnerships, but through your new free trade union. How can we talk about what the relationships are between our market and your free trade area and what, what spaces we want to create for technology transfer, for conversations about building lead markets together, that's co-development. It's not saying we have an energy partnership that we want you to be part of. It's actually going in and saying, this is what we have, this is what you have, this is where they overlap, and this is what we want to fund. That doesn't mean not having conditionalities on your funding, because you can very honestly say, look, this part of your vision, we're not the funders for it. And guess what? Maybe China is, maybe Russia is, that is not preference, but we're not going to fund it. But this bit we are. And I think that is that requires dialogue. That requires a ton of dialogue and is incredibly capacity intensive, which is why the main thing that worries me about the glo global gateway is we don't have humans behind it. Because if you have four commissioners at the helm with an undisclosed part of their time meant to be on delivering this and no clear delivery team other than the 20 full time equivalents that we just had work on climate diplomacy that will have no authority on this because they probably weren't even the people who wrote it let alone have the authority to go to those people actually programming um, EU international and development finance, which don't even sit in Klima or the external action service. They sit in the international kind of development partnership commission branch. Sorry, EU lingo. I'm trying not to use as much jargon. Um, that's an issue. You need a team that it, whose job it is to actually mainstream this, to go out and look at projects and say, this is a global gateway project, but this is not because it does not overlap with, with our strategic vision here. Otherwise it is just another pretty envelope. And I don't think the world needs just another pretty envelope. It needs a plan and a willingness to engage with partners on what revamp projects need to be. Now there's a lot of opportunity for that, but you need humans put behind it. And that's really what our proposal and the report is as well put a dedicated team with some real political weight behind it. And I think we have the political weight, but we don't have the humans to actually deliver on that political weight right now. So Hannah Neumann, what does the parliament want to see from Global Gateway, or at least what does your group have ideas about what 
this should achieve. I mean, uh, maybe an ungenerous remark would be that this is a project which has been conceived on a defensive because it's very much in response to Belt and Road. So what is the EU's unique proposition going into these uh, into parts of the world set with Global Gateway? I just give me just a second because I have an issue with my headphones, but I think you should be able to hear me now. We can hear you okay. fine. Yeah, perfect. So on, on the Global Gateway, and maybe just to, to pick up um, on what Jennifer said, the idea of the Global Gateway, and I would not so much say it's in defensive um, to, the belt, uh, to, to the Chinese approach. Um, the idea behind the Global Gateway is to provide a platform and an envelope, as Jennifer said, and for an alternative approach to organize these flows of goods but also an alternative approach in terms of linking co to co-develop in the end. That's that's another idea behind it, and to link it without um, forcing our um, countries to buy up either to to some kind of Chinese ideology and some kind of Chinese credit structures that we have seen in the past. And I think a number of African countries have become quite aware of that. Um, that 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 are not actually useful and um, to the development, the long more longer term and inclusive development to countries and societies as a whole. But that have been more useful to some some leaders who then um, took off with money, and we have seen all of these developments and I think it was high time that the European Union starts to position itself in this and, and comes up with an alternative approach. The question now is and I think um, Jennifer rightfully and the study rightfully um, puts that forward is how can we fill it with life and how can we can we fill it with leverage that's the other one and here it is important that this narrative this concept that this ambition is filled with human resources and that can manage to organize this. But I think it's also important that EU member states and especially the big ones see themselves as part of it. So as long as it's an European Union only thing, it will not fly. But if Germany, for example, aligns its funding priorities and its strategic priorities with the gateway, if France aligns, if Spain aligns, if Italy aligns, and if maybe it's open to also other third countries, so I'm thinking of Great Britain, of Australia and others, that's when it flies. Um, and, and I think that's what we need to achieve. This can not be done by the human resource capital somewhere in Brussels. It's needed to, to do the organizational stuff. This has to come with political will and ambition. And um, at least on the German side, we have mentioned the global gateway at some critical points in the coalition agreement. Um, we will have to see how this is being uh, picked up and filled with life. But there is a lot of potential. Just because CBAM has been raised, Marion, please allow me to, to make another point which links to Hannah Ryder's not have any exclusive approach issue. Um, when it comes to CBAM, what I think is crucial, and it's a bit sad that Mark is not here anymore, is first of all to convince, to make it not a European Union protectionist scheme but to convince others who are already embarking into um, working towards, let's say rather carbon, low carbon or no carbon technologies, to see it as a chance to join the club and have all their industrial development, engineering and others somehow rewarded. So that would be an interesting opening for GCC countries, for example. But we also need to make sure that, and that brings me back to the co-developed point that Jennifer made so strong, that we can bring others who do not have these capacities, these technologies and everything at hand to support them in also living up to this level and go, going these steps. So it, that it's not seen as we are protecting our European Union engineering and doing it as a way to, to then, I mean, shut out the others of the market, but that we say, these are the technologies we have, this is how you can participate, this is how you also can make your own industry climate neutral. And then if you embark on this way, we are going to support you. And then you will also have prefer preferential access to the EU market and the other markets will become part of the club. So it really has to be a club that makes sure we are discussed, but we, we, we help you all the way to reach it. And, and I think if we have this narrative, then it's an encouraging and empowering one to bring everyone on the transformation. And this should be the goal behind it, whether we call it CBAM or whatever, but that's the idea. Brilliant, thank you. Um, CBAM is, is still being, is still part of the 55 package. So I think it will go through some reincarnations before we know exactly what it looks like. Um, but we're coming to the end. Um, 
Uh, Hannah Ryder, why don't you give us some of your closing remarks and some responses if you want to. Um, and then Jennifer, we can go to you. We also had a question um, from one of the audience members who said if you had to sort of prioritize a couple of your key themes that you wanted the EU realistically to achieve as quickly as possible, what would they do? Um, and then we will wrap up. So Hannah, we'll go, we'll go back to you. Thank you. So very quickly, I think, um, because I, I don't want to take up too much more time, two, two, two things to mention just in terms of Global Gateway uh, responding to the audience question and, and also um, on CBAM as well. So in terms of, uh, of, the, of Global Gateway, I agree very much um, with that sentiment that it shouldn't be uh, kind of the ultimate goal really needs to be very carefully uh carefully expressed and, and understood, if it is access to raw materials, that, that is a, a massive challenge for um, development partners because they are looking to add value um, rather than uh, continue to supply raw materials. So um, some kind of partnership on that. However, at the same time, again, talking about what recipient countries or kind of partners are looking for from, from EU and others, including China, is continued concessional loans, which is why um, uh, the fact that Global Gateway at the moment does not say anything about concessionality, uh, whether from the public or private sector, um, is an issue. And, uh, and, and so kind of how the EU engages in terms of the multilateral development banks, helping them to kind of move and shift towards providing more concessionality, both for low income and middle income countries, for infrastructure in particular, um, clean infrastructure, of course, that's not a problem. Um, but it's really about where is the availability of finance and if it's just a private sector um, with commercial loans that's that's not particularly helpful remember that 23 african countries uh, do not have any credit ratings so they do have zero mm. access to the private sector okay so um <laughs> we, we always forget this um then just on cbam i think if cbam was was at, announced at the same time as let's say you know a doubling of the european union carbon price kind of saying look we're going to go um with the emissions trading we're going to be cutting down our emissions way more than we we're expecting and we, than we'd plan to and this is why we also want to have CBAM, but we will have exceptions for the poorest countries you know a package like that is 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 way more credible than just we're just providing C, you know here is CBAM and, and we're not really sure about the not really sure about what exception exemptions there'll be and we have to negotiate those exemptions etc um, and and where is the concomitant European uh, European action, which is then driven up? Um, it, it cannot be on its own. So that that's that's really the only message I would give um, in terms of external messaging. And it goes back to this point about being a role model um, and and avoiding being uh, seen as sort of hypocritical. Thank you. Uh, and Jennifer, the last word goes to you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to give you a short list. I'm really sorry, because my main message back to the audience is um, we need a step change from EU action on this. Like, good climate diplomacy isn't enough when we're facing an existential crisis. And right now, we're having a lot of the rhetoric about the existential crisis and very little of the action, the delivery systems, the fundamental restructuring of of EU institutions that we need to, to respond to that existential crisis abroad. That's just the reality. And I think Mark was, was fantastic in showing us some of the barriers also internally, because there are real barriers to fundamentally restructuring something this big. But that is what we need if we're actually going to see the EU play a major role in halving emissions this decade and actually creating climate safety for European citizens, but also for international partners. And if we don't take a really ambitious approach to this, then I'm sorry, but we need to be prepping for a 2.7 degree world and all of the, the very tough choices that will undermine EU values that will probably come along with that. So I think this is the moment to not be talking about realistic options. It's time to be talking about the ambitious transformational options. I think there are some clear priorities while you're doing that that you invest in next year. I think it is the global public 
finance shift, because that is what is needed to help shift other partners this decade. I think it is some of the mechanics within the EU that actually give you a sense of where the hell you even are, like leveraging parliamentary budgetary oversight, like this EU external action, state of external action report, but also like actually establishing a conversation across the relevant ministers from all of your member states so that we do get member state buy-in, because there's no point us doing it, as Hannah very rightfully said, if we don't get at least the major EU member states who shape realistically EU external projection on board. So I think those are kind of the first steps, but the reality is you need the whole program. Maybe not just our whole program. I'm sure others will have whole programs as well. And I'm hoping to see a lot of those pop up over the next couple of weeks, months, and stay in dialogue on this. But we need to change how we think about it because tinkering around the edges isn't working anymore. Thank you, you, Jennifer. And and, um, and well done for E3G for getting this out. I think it's probably going to become, uh, not just because you have a sort of first mover advantage, but I think it will become a, a reference point for a lot of um, further work in this area with some luck. Um, so my last task is just to say thank you to everyone, to both Hannah's and to Jennifer. For those who are interested who want to read the report, the links have been put into the chat. Um, you can find it there and read it for yourself and, and make what you want of it. Um, and... Uh, Sorry, last task actually is Hannah. As you opened, we'll give you the final floor. Just for we'll give you about probably just only about ninety seconds to give your closing remarks on where we go from here. Perfect. Thanks so much. And I guess that's the privilege of the one who pays for the whole party. Um, first of all, thank you all for being there. And I totally agree with Jennifer. And that's why we outsource this task. We need to be ambitious. We need to think about the barriers that are there and how we can move them away. We may not be able to reach all of them, but we need to be challenged to break the patterns that have kept us from doing the steps that are needed in the light of the actual crisis at the moment. The key points that I would take away from today, so I'm trying to do the job for Jennifer, um, we need to fully align all policies behind the climate one, also not to to compromise our credibility. Um, We need to leverage capital, private as well as state capital, and also think about creatively about how we can, can use it, but make sure all capital we spend is streamlined on the climate issue. Um, We need to make sure we have a role model function. We continue having it by being credible in our own domestic implementation of Green Deal, Fit for 55 and others. And we need to make sure that by moving ahead, we do that in a way that we leave complementary roles and take everyone on board who wants to also work on that transition. The upcoming EU golf strategy, by the way, will be one key example where we can for the first time show how take that idea into action and how we can see ways for everyone to be part of this endeavor. And the discussion will continue. I'm happy we kickstarted it today. And again, thank you all who were here today. And thanks E3G and all their partners, Jennifer, Leah, and so on for the amazing work you did. Yeah, I will echo that. And thank you very much for having me and for Mark for also uh, participating. Um, and I wish everyone a happy uh, Christmas and a nice break. And I think this is definitely an issue we'll come back to. And if you want to read about it, I'm sure I'll give myself a plug, but I'm sure the FT will be covering this in depth. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.